So this is Biology 1100 Vancouver Community College. And this lecture is called Descent with Modification, a Darwinian View of Life. So that's what Darwin called evolution at the beginning, descent with modification, which is indeed what happens. Uh, you are modified from your parents. You're not exactly the same. And indeed, your generation is different in some ways than your parents' generation. So descent with modification was the term that Darwin gave to evolution. It was a very revolutionary, this thought. So he published uh, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection in 1859. And Let's see, 1889, 1959, uh, 2009. I think that was it. The, the 150th, um, the 150th anniversary from the publication of this was celebrated all over the world. Yeah, in 2009. And um, that is when they replaced poor Owen's statue <laughs> with Darwin's statue. So I think Owen still did a lot of good by putting together that, that museum, the Museum of Natural History, which is amazing. Um, and interestingly, Darwin contributed a lot of his specimens to the Museum of Natural History in, in London. I think it's in London. But a lot of them, he, he brought back so much on the Beagle that a lot of his specimens have not even been classified yet quite remarkable. And it focused uh, attention on the great diversity of organisms, which I think Attenborough did such a good job in the beginning of the film that we just watched um, on displaying the diversity of organisms. Like, uh, I can't remember how many species there were of each type, but uh, hummingbirds, <laughs> there was 600 different species of hummingbird alone. So how many species of beetle? I can't remember, but I believe that beetles have the most species of any invertebrate. I think there's a 350,000. Uh, that could be, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's a lot. How many species of mammals? I think there are 4,400 species of mammal, so considerably less than the number of beetles, which are incredibly diverse. Do you recognize this animal? Iguana? Yeah, it's an iguana. It's a land iguana in the Galapagos Islands. And you know, when Darwin first saw them, he, he, wrote, he wrote in his journal that he thought they had kind of a stupid expression. <laughs> he used that terminology. But um, yeah, it's an iguana. So there are lots of iguanas on the Galapagos Islands, not only iguan uh, land iguanas, but marine iguanas. And it was when he saw marine iguanas literally like climbing out of the water. They spent a lot of their time in water looking for food, algae in particular. So they're underwater a lot of the time. And then, oh, they're on land. Those, they're actually land animals. And so a lot, of, a lot of Darwin's issues that he would be thinking about during that time were things like, well, how does a water animal, uh, a fish, for example, um, transform to a land animal. There's so many hurdles to overcome, like breathing and locomotion and temperature control and supporting the mass of the animal, uh, reproduction and circulation. All of these were these, you know, you, if you think about Darwin during that time, these are huge questions. You know, we've answered those questions. Now we can look at animals and see how they've changed to adapt to living on land. But the first animals were still tied to water, like amphibians, for example, still had to reproduce in water. So it wasn't a complete 
all of a sudden transition. It did take time. So when Darwin wrote um, The Origin of Species, he made two major points. Uh, evidence that the many species of organisms presently inhabiting the earth are descendants of ancestral species. So for example, uh, one thing that Darwin would have noticed in his travels are fossils. And he would think to himself, well, one question that would come to mind would be like, why would God allow some species to become extinct? And of course, it turns out that there are literally 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed on the planet are now extinct. And then he proposed a mechanism for uh, this evolutionary process of natural selection. So it challenged this traditional view that Owen and other people had that species always were the same. They, un, they were unchanged. So his views, of course, in the context of Western ideas about Earth and his life were pretty crazy, but there were, and this is really important to think about, when you think about his life in the 1800s, what was happening at the same time. So there were advances and discoveries in all kinds of different areas. And the reason he wrote to so many people was to gather this information. So for example, um, during well, before his time, let's say he was born in 1809, I guess, around there. So Linnaeus had already been around, but he had, he had established a method of naming new species. So by the time Darwin came along, there had been, there had been um, explorers in all corners of the world bringing back all these new specimens plants and animals and fungus that nobody had ever seen before. And so Linnaeus developed this means of classification we now know as binomial nomenclature or nomenclature, depending on who you talk to, <laughs> which is Latin, uh, Latin names, including genus and the species name. So for example, if we're talking about uh, humans, humans are homo sapiens. And you'd never just say sapiens, you always say homo sapiens because the genus is always included. So binomial, because there's two names, homo being the genus, sapiens being the species. Binomial nomenclature, nomen <laughs> it depends on where you put the emphasis on the word. <laughs> So other discoveries that were made and overlapped with Darwin's life are the discoveries of Hutton, which is um, gradual geologic change. So it takes a long time for rock to erode. It takes a long time for sediments to pack down into solid rock, metamorphic or not metamorphic, sedimentary rock. Yeah, so gradual geologic change, including erosion and sedimentation. Um, Lamarck was a chap who was around during that time, but he suggested that features one developed in one's lifetime would be passed on to the next generation, things that you acquired in your lifetime. So, so say you did a lot of working out, you acquired uh, large muscles, well, you would pass those on to your offspring. Sorry, I couldn't think of another example right just then, but um, yeah. But he did think species could change from one generation to the next. That was a novel, that was a novel idea back then. But his, his mechanism was different than Darwin's. Darwin's was natural selection. Lamarck's was acquired characteristics during the, the individual's lifetime. 
would be passed on. So, and these are important people. These were important influences on the way one would have to think during that time to figure out the diversity of life on earth. So another uh, person was Malthus. And he could see that populations could, could grow exponentially if all of the offspring survived. So he saw that there were limits on population size, not exponential. Uh, Cuvier was instrumental in finding fossils and figured out, oh, some things went extinct. You just don't see them. Lyle was uh, into modern geology, which includes, uh, I don't actually know actually, what did Lyle publish? Principles of geology. So that I think also included formation of rock, you know, how do, where does metamorphic rock come from? Igneous rock, sedimentary rock, uh, slow processes of erosion, sedimentation. Um, I, I'm not sure when plate tectonics actually was discovered or talked about, but Darwin thought of it on his journey. So this is a person who is extremely observant and can make some leaps in logic. So he noticed in Australia that corals grew quite far away from the land, but that corals required sunlight. So he thought they must have moved away. And he started to think that maybe continents move away from each other, a really novel kind of way of thinking or a thought that even continents could change. So that was really, really an interesting time. <laughs> So natural selection, Darwin, that was his time. And of course, as we saw on the show, uh, Mendel came up with his factors of inheritance. And Wallace, much to Darwin's chagrin, I'm sure, was coming up with evolution by natural selection at the same time. But poor Wallace, he was quite poor. He wasn't like Darwin who had pots of money, <laughs> but Wallace, he was sent off or he went to work for uh, museums to send back or bring back specimens from all over the world. And he had to do that for a living. So he didn't have the luxury of spending 20 years like Darwin did gathering evidence for his theory of evolution by natural selection. Yeah. And so these were all the things that were published during the, the time of those people. Very interesting time. So of course, yeah, there was a lot of resistance to the idea. Western culture was like, no way. <laughs> because it challenged a worldview that had been prevalent for centuries. And, and, you know, nowadays, are we more inclined to accept new discoveries than people in the 19th century? I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think we are. Um, because even Galen's book, the Roman that wrote uh, about anatomy, his work was accepted for 1500 years and some of it was quite wrong, like the four humors of the body, for example. So yeah, for some reason during that time, I think the church had quite a lot to do with it. Um, ideas were held onto and you weren't allowed to explore beyond those ideas like of the Bible, for example. And in Spain, of course, you faced the Spanish Inquisition if you dared to um, suggest anything new or different. Uh, er even Aristotle, he was a smart cookie, but he believed uh, species were fixed and unchanging. And the Bible, of course, holds that species were individually designed by God and therefore perfect. And of course, once you start, um, once you start finding fossils, you're like, well, <laughs> this fossil couldn't have been that perfect because these this species went extinct. So indeed, there's nothing about um, about mutations 
that suggest that they're going to be better. Indeed, mutations, which is the, um, the ultimate source of variation, are more often deleterious than beneficial. But if they are beneficial, then they will help the organism survive and be passed on to the next generation. Yeah, so Linnaeus, Carolus Linnaeus, that wasn't his original name. I can't remember what it was, but he changed it, interestingly, to this Latin name when he started his binomial nomenclature. Yeah, he interpreted adaptations as evidence that a creator had indeed designed these for species for a specific purpose. Uh, he was the founder of taxonomy, but he classified diversity for the greater glory of God. He was a God-fearing person and still believed that species were unchanging. Well, here come other people of the time who are willing to go against the canon of society, which is a big thing. Because poor Darwin, he got ridiculed a lot. Well, let's look at fossils. They really helped lay the groundwork for Darwin's ideas because he did look at them and think, why would God allow anything to go extinct? Um, and then, of course, uh, there, the remains are traces of organisms from the past. And you find them in sedimentary rock. Well, we can see here from the canyon that there are layers and layers and layers and layers. Indeed, the Grand Canyon, if you look at all the layers, the bottom, you're looking at, uh, what are you looking at? <laughs> I'm forgetting now how many billions of years, I think one or 1.1 billion years or something like that is the, the bottom of the Grand Canyon, the oldest rocks were, which are at the bottom. And so what was, what was the Grand Canyon once? Ocean. That is largely where sedimentation occurs. Is exposed. usually pushed upward by volcanic activity or plates moving together, uh, occurs, it's exposed, and then eroded again by rivers. <laughs> moving over here to write something else, eroded again, to reveal, no, by rivers, sorry, by rivers, to reveal layers up to one billion years old. So of course you would expect the fossils that are lower to be older than the fossils that are above. And that's a, a pretty important concept. Paleontology is the study of fossils. Uh, it's paleontology and studying fossils is addictive. <laughs> Cuvier um, opposed the idea of gradual evolutionary change. He thought that catastrophes caused change. So he thought that the boundary between each layer was some kind of catastrophe, like a, a volcano, a volcano or, or earthquake. And yeah, sometimes there are catastrophes, but more often than not, changes geologically are very gradual. And that gradualism is the idea that Changes can take place through a cumulative effect of slow but continual processes like 
sedimentation. And in the case of descent with modification, accumulation of genetic changes over generations, which is macroevolution. Sure, we change a little bit from our parents. Every, every organism through, at least uh, with sexual reproduction, the offspring are different than the parents. Sometimes those differences are quite small. But in a population, those differences can really accumulate over time, long times. Yeah. So continuous actions that are still operating today. Uh, and that really influenced Darwin and Darwin's thinking about uh, evolution. He figured, well, if cumulative changes could be slowly changing the geology of the Earth, and he witnessed a lot of uh, geologic phenomena, then cumulative changes could conceivably happen with species as well over time. So Lamarck hypothesized that they, uh, species evolved through the use. So whatever you used a lot, you would pass on to the next generation. But if you didn't use something, then um, you would not pass it along. Uh, but there, there was no evidence for that, except actually now there is. <laughs> There's no evidence maybe in, in macroevolution, but really nowadays there's a whole um, area of research called epigenetics. which is how, um, I guess, molecules other than DNA can confer traits, as it turns out. And they are largely from uh, proteins such as histones. around which DNA is wrapped. And that's another whole topic. Um, it doesn't discount the theory of evolution by natural selection. Of course, we know that that's a right theory. Um, a theory, of course, in science is a body of evidence that's backed up by facts and lots of experimentation and loads of observation. But it does turn out that there is such a thing as epigenetics and, and some, there is evidence that some things that happen during your lifetime can uh, make differences in the offspring. So I don't remember the study exactly, but there was a study with uh, rats and uh, rat parents being very um, attentive to the offspring. And then it turned out that the generations later, the offspring still exhibited that behavior, but not through DNA. It's not, and not through learning either. <laughs> I don't really know how the experiment was conducted, but, but it was very interesting. It did show epigenetics. So Darwin proposed that, proposed that species change through what's called natural selection. Yeah. Um, uh, a major change would challenge this thinking. Um, so a little bit about Darwin, even though we've just seen quite a bit of him. <laughs> he was really interested in nature. His dad wanted him to become, uh, I think first a doctor, but he couldn't stand the sight of blood, made him faint. <laughs> so then I think he was going to go into the clergy, you know, become a minister or whatever, but decided not to, and then got accepted onto the Beagle to be a naturalist, which is kind of cool. Really changed his life, that's for sure. And, well, 
maybe we would, would have changed anyway, but our, our view of why there's so much biodiversity on Earth. So he, yeah, he observed, collected loads and loads of specimens from South America, uh, lots and lots of beetles, lots of ants, lots of plants. He was a very kind person, Darwin. Um, he couldn't understand uh, when he was in South America, there were slaves and he couldn't understand why, why people were so uh, hardly treated. That really bothered him a lot. Um, he was very observant. He, he observed adaptations of plants and animals that inhabited many, many, many diverse environments. Yeah, super, super observant person. Adaptations are those characteristics that allow a person to allow a person, sorry, characteristics that allow an individual organism to live successfully in their environment. Yeah, so there he is going from the beagle, boop, 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 South America, around South America. This is the Galapagos Islands here, coming back through Australia a two-year voyage that ended up being five years <laughs> on the Beagle. And poor guy, he was also seasick a lot of the time. Yeah, I think he was quite happy when the Beagle uh, landed somewhere. <laughs> so yeah, he assessed what he observed, um, noticing that adaptations um, and the origin of new species is quite closely related, closely related processes because species change over time very slowly. So for example, let's see an example. Let's look at uh, finches. So finches, uh, they have different beaks. So here's one, it's a cactus eater. It's got a long sharp beak. It tears and eats the cactus flowers. Uh, this one is a seed eater. It has a really large, deep beak and it cracks seeds. And then there's the insect eater um, that can eat insects. It's got a, a narrow pointed beak to grab insects. But, oh, although Darwin didn't know this, but the Galapagos Islands are only a million and a half years old. They're not very old in geologic time. So where did they come from? They were very similar, but not exactly the same. So it is possible that they had a common ancestor. Finches could have had a common ancestor. And indeed, now, when you look at um, to the Galapagos is off of Ecuador, and on the mainland, South America, there are mainland finches. So they must be the ancestors of the Galapagos finches because they're really the only ones that could have arrived there and they would have arrived by air and maybe small populations. And because of the uh, isolation offshoot populations of the mainland population, So now you've got a subpopulation that's living on the Galapagos Island. There's some competition there. But this is, these are new islands. So these are new ecological opportunities. For populations of finches. <laughs> 
So these ecological opportunities, the cacti and the, the seeds and the insects, uh, they were new. If those ecological niches, say being an insect eater, was already taken by a species, then a new population, no matter how well adapted their new characteristics might be, couldn't move in. There would be too much competition from what's already there. So those are two really important concepts for evolution by natural selection. Uh, the first is isolation offshoot populations from a mainland or from somewhere else, and new ecological opportunities. So these two ideas are important for natural selection and evolution. So it's very important to remember is that natural selection works on the individual and evolution on the population. Evolution is a population change. So individuals are selected by natural selection, or in the case of Darwin, he studied uh, artificial selection with dogs and horses and sheep. So individuals are selected, uh, populations evolve. That's a really important concept to remember. So yeah, Darwin wrote this uh, essay, The Origin of Species. Um, he didn't really want to publish it as you recall from the film. And then he received uh, Wallace's manuscript and he was like, oh boy, <laughs> I better get my ass in gear <laughs> and do some publishing. Yeah, so he quickly finished it and published it in the next year. So he developed these two main ideas that are in the origin of species of that book, um, that evolution explains life's unity and diversity, unity. We are all made of cells containing DNA. Diversity. Our DNA is in different sequences and mm, I guess amount. It's amazing that those four nucleotides um, result in such diversity. But then when you look at something like paramecium, it's got cilia, you know, that wave it through the water. And humans have cilia on our trachea and they're exactly the same cilia. They're made in exactly the same way. It's very interesting. So the phrase descent with modification really sums up Darwin's perception. Uh, it states that all organisms are related through descent from an ancestor that lived in the remote past. And so let's look at an ancestral tree or uh, a tree of life or a phylogenetic tree. Lots of branching from a common trunk. These are the living organisms here, living or extant is another word for living today. Well, um, this elephant, the Loxodonta africana in Africa, 
and the Loxodonta cyclotis in Africa, they are very, very similar, but not exactly the same, and they don't interbreed. So they must have had a common ancestor back here. Whenever you see the branch point, that's when a common ancestor existed. Sometimes we're lucky and there might be um, uh, some fossil evidence of that common ancestor, but you know, fossils don't really form that readily. You'd think they do, but they don't. Fossils are fairly rare to form. Yeah, so back here a little further in time, there's another common ancestor, including the common ancestor of that elephant species in Asia, which is more different, if that's the right way of saying it, than these two. So this is a common ancestor a little bit further back in time and so on. So we go further back in time and here, some of these species are not extant, they're extinct. But if we go way back to a common ancestor of a manatee, which is an aquatic um, mammal, and the hyrexes, which are terrestrial, they are related, but very, very distantly related to these species. Distant relatives, but relatives, but they're dissimilar enough that their ancestor must have been around a long time ago. And so this is the common ancestor way back here. This is millions of years ago, so that looks like it's 35 and maybe 45 million years ago or something like that. Yeah. So some of, some of these uh, ancestral species are around in the fossil record. Are they a transitional species? Maybe, maybe not. So Ernst Mayer, who wrote a phenomenally huge number of books and was still writing when he was 92, which just shows you that if you keep your mind active, you could be writing books too in your 90s. <laughs> and he dissected the logic of Darwin's theory into three inferences based on five observations. Now, this isn't really the way that, that um, I would present it, but this is, this is the only lecture that I could find. My other one seemed to have gone missing, but it's pretty good. Um, observation number one, for any species, population sizes would increase exponentially if all individuals reproduced successfully. If every one of those offspring grew up to reproductive age and had their own offspring. Well, if, it, if that were elephants, the entire world would be covered in elephants and there wouldn't be room for anything else. Not only that, the entire world would, world would be covered in elephants in like a few years, less than a hundred years. So that was one observation. Whoops, so oh, I went too fast. Observation two. Populations are stable, except for seasonal fluctuations. There is a carrying capacity for populations that we discovered in ecology. And observation number three, resources are limited. So this is the inference from those observations. This production of more individuals than the environment can support leads to a struggle for existence with only a fraction of their offspring surviving. And those offspring are successful to reproductive age. Observation number four. Members of a population vary extensively in their characteristics. No two individuals are exactly alike. Uh, I'm looking at these beetles, and the first the first thing I'm, I see when I'm looking at them, I go, "Oh yeah, they're all they're all alike." 
However, if you look closely, they're not. Some of them are, are uh, black in color with orange dots. Some are orange with black dots. Um, what are some other differences? The placement of the dots, I guess. So there, there, there's variation. They're not exactly alike. That's another observation. Oh, observation number five, this variation is heritable. This very, the variations are heritable. In other words, those, those traits can be passed down to the next generation. They're heritable. So what can we infer from that? Survival depends in part on inherited traits. It might also depend in part on learned traits or even just uh, accidental luck of the draw of finding yourself where the fire was not, for example. But in part, survival depends on inherited traits. The fastest runner can escape the fire, for example. A high probability of surviving and reproducing so they will leave more offspring than the other individuals. Uh, those offspring will have their genes. So inference number three, the unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce leads to a gradual change in a population with favorable, I'm gonna put a U in there, <laughs> characteristics accumulating over generations. through natural selection. So natural selection is a mechanism whereby um, favorable, otherwise known as adaptive, well adapted to the environment, characteristics are, I'm going to put chosen, of course, nothing is consciously chosen in natural selection, but if this individual escaped the fire because of its very, very fast running, probably more uh, fast twitch muscle, for example, then that trait is selected. We can see traits being selected artificially by humans. It happens much, much more quickly, of course, than natural selection. Natural selection can take a really long time. But humans modify species quite readily by selecting and breeding individuals that possess desired traits. Uh, I love this example. This is a wild mustard plant. Look at that. It's just a, a sort of nondescript looking plant with yellow flowers <laughs> that you find in the wild. Well, through choosing individuals with mutations, certain mutations, and breeding those together, oh my goodness, you get cabbage, you get cauliflower, you get broccoli, you get Brussels sprouts from the buds, like these are all from different parts of the plant, you get kale, and you get kohlrabi. So uh, the flower from, from selecting plants with particular flowers and stems, you get broccoli, uh, flowers, you get cauliflower, Selecting terminal buds, you get cabbage. Selecting for lateral buds, you get uh, Brussels sprouts. Selecting for certain types of leaves, you get kale. And selecting for certain types of stems, you get kohlrabi. These are all considered, these days, the same species. But you look at them, and you're looking at them from a morphological perspective, and you're you're like, 
no, those aren't the same. They're different enough. So when do you decide that this cabbage is a different species than the broccoli? When do you decide that a Pomeranian is a different species than a Great Dane? It depends on how you define species. The biological definition of species Uh, populations of individuals that interbreed. And I know that doesn't work for asexual reproduction, all that kind of stuff, but we'll get into that another time. So natural selection is Differential success in reproduction. Yeah, and that results in uh, the interaction between individuals uh, that vary in their traits and their environment. Over time, adaptations to their environment um, may increase. So this is this is an example or two examples of what's known as co-evolution. So I don't know if you can tell here, but there in this diagram here, there is a mantis, a flower mantid in Malaysia. And here there is a stick mantid in Africa. So what is the advantage? What is the adaptive advantage for this mantis here, the flower mantid? Could this flower mantid be camouflaged enough to capture prey with the prey not even knowing that it's there? Sure, yeah. Uh, or could be hiding from predators, the stick mantid. Same thing, looks exactly like a stick. So these are adaptations that are very, very specific to the environment, very specific adaptations. So, well, what if the environment changes over time? Natural selection may result in adaptation to these new conditions. So Darwin's theory of evolution continues to be tested by how effectively it can account for additional observations and experimental outcomes. Uh, two examples provide evidence for natural selection. Um, differential predation in guppy populations. So one thing to be aware of is that natural selection isn't just an, obs an observed phenomenon from the past. It has been observed in current research, natural selection. So in this experiment, uh, these guppies were transplanted from pike cichlid pools to killifish pools and measured. They measured the age and size of guppies over 11 years. That's a lot of generations. That's 30 to 60 generations. Yeah. So. What happened was uh, these guppies are larger at sexual maturity. And um, where are the other ones? Because the predator preys mainly on large guppies. So in that case, the guppies are smaller. You know, I shouldn't be talking about this experiment because it's the first time I've seen it. <laughs> you know what? I'm not gonna talk about this particular experiment. I don't know it well enough, I admit that freely. Could I instead please talk about the three-spine stickleback in British Columbia, which is where Dolph Schluter decided instead of working in the Galapagos, 
He's going to work in British Columbia on these species of three spines to come back. Oh my gosh, I have three minutes. The three spines to come back. Well, it's very similar to the finches in the Galapagos. British Columbia covered in ice. 15,000 years ago. So where did all the fish that are in our streams and lakes come from? That's interesting. There's a marine species of three spine stickleback In our lakes and, and uh, most lakes, I think, I mean, they're, they're here in Lost Lagoon and various other places. Over the last 12,000 years only, which isn't really that long, these two, I should say this marine species has diverged or speciated into two different species a large one and a small one. Why? Because there were new ecological opportunities and the populations had diverged from their parent population. I'm going to stop there. Okay, thank you for watching. We'll continue next time.